we can continue our study in the book of Romans, and Lord willing, we'll finish chapter 1 today. I don't know how many weeks we've been on this, but it's been a while. 15. <laughs> yeah, I mean, where you really count? <laughs> <laughs> Romans chapter 1, verses 31 and 32. We'll go ahead and begin reading in verse 28 to get a, the whole context here. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, and inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Here we are coming to the end of our list of the descriptors of man's wickedness. Mm -hmm. We pick up in verse 31 when he says, without understanding. That's, they're foolish, they're ignorant, they're really without an understanding of God. They're without an understanding of who he is. This is the same as we saw back in verse 21, that they had their hearts were darkened, that their mind became foolish. Mm -hmm. They didn't properly understand God and who he is. That is these that are without understanding here, that they don't, they might know of God or a God, and they might have some God in their mind that they have conceived themselves, but they don't truly understand the God of the Bible. Right. And so is the way with sin, it always leads us away from the right understanding of God. Amen. It always obscures our view of God. Even in our own lives, sin will obscure us from having a correct view of who God is. Amen. But even more so in the young saved who are full of sin and wickedness. Verse, oh, excuse me, back in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, we want to turn there, but when uh, the Pharisees were ridiculing the disciples about eating with unwashing hands, and, you know, I know I used that several times already, but Christ said to them, are you without understanding? Right. Are you, you're being <laughs> them and asked them, are you ignorant of these things? And really spiritually, they were ignorant of those things. Amen. Yeah, they were so focused on the outward appearance that they failed to realize that it's what came out of a man, not what went into a man that defiles him. Amen. Religiousness doesn't necessarily make one have a right understanding of God. The Catholics are full of religion, but yet they don't have a true understanding of who God is. The devout Muslims, they have their religion, and they are often very faithful to it, but yet they don't have an understanding of who the real God is. Amen. I think we're all familiar with the Amish and Mennonites in the area, and they are very religious to their, you know, they're very faithful to their own beliefs, but yet even they are without real knowledge of who God is. Amen. You know, God must reveal himself to us to Amen. have a true understanding of who he is. It goes on to say, without understanding and covenant breakers. That's those who don't honor their word, those who break contracts and agreements or coven covenants. And we are told to, to be faithful to our word. James 5, 12 says we're not to swear, but the Lord is supposed to let our communication be yea and nay. It's supposed to be yes and no. We're not supposed to say yes when we mean no or Amen. vice versa. Well, we go over to Matthew chapter 5 and Christ explains it in even more detail. Matthew chapter 5 verses 33 and 30. Verse 337. Here he says, Again ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou 
shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, nor for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by yeah. Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. These Huey commands regarding swearing, but notice what he says in verse 37. He says, But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For Amen. Whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. We should be true to what our word is, but he tells us not to swear by these things, so we don't have power over them. But whenever we do make agreements and contracts or covenants, we should honor those. You've had we live in a world, a society that's full of lawsuits and such because people don't honor their word. Right. Yeah. But that is what these covenant breakers are. But ultimately, we have all outside of Christ broken the covenant with God. Amen. Let's turn back to Isaiah chapter 24 and we see God's punishment for this thing. Isaiah chapter 24, we'll read verses 3 through 6. Here he says, The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away, the haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth is also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Amen. God does not take lightly to the breaking of our covenant with him. Israel broke its covenants, and they suffered for it. Amen. Eventually they would be scattered throughout the world and not be a nation again until 1948. But even all the earth in general, all the people that have transgressed against the covenant God originally made with man. Amen. Because of that, one day the earth will be destroyed. Because of that, now the earth is full of the curse of sin, full of the suffering and pain and the effects of sin. Mm -hmm. And one day it will be completely burned up, we know. And we'll have a new heaven and a new earth. But until then, it shall languish on and be desolate and continue to decay more and more. Mm -hmm. We need to be careful about breaking covenants. Mm -hmm. We need to be careful about making covenants, especially with God, because He will hold us accountable. If we go back to our text here in, excuse me, in Romans chapter 1. The next thing we have listed is without natural affection. Mm -hmm. That is, they're hard hearted, especially towards those that they should love. They, they lack natural love that is you know, instinctive. Such as uh, love a mother should have for her children. Be bad. We saw some of this back in verses 26 and 27 when the men left the natural use of the woman and the woman left the natural use of the woman as well, as mm -hmm. Paul described it. Things such as abortion are the exact opposite of natural affection. Amen. Men and women, especially, not caring for their children. Men not having a love for their wives and families. Mm -hmm. Those are types of affections that should come naturally. And yet, we see more and more that it's people are without this natural affection. Right. This is also listed in Second Timothy 3.3 3, when he describes the last days. We'll touch on that here in a moment. But... We shouldn't be surprised though when we see more and more of these things come to pass. Right. We go on from natural affection to say implacable. That's 
someone who can't be placated or reconciled. Mm -hmm. Someone who's unforgiving, who's they're called truce breakers in 2 Timothy 3, that they hold grudges, that they are offended and not willing to forgive. Mm -hmm. And so should it never be for us when we see it often among the wicked, don't we? That I even see it among God's people, how we hold grudges sometimes when someone right. offends us or does something against us. But what did Christ say in the model prayer, Matthew 6? Well, first, he, when he's praying, he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then, right. And explaining in verse 15, he says that we, if we don't forgive others, God will not forgive us. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4.32 tells us that we're to forgive one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. And how much has God forgiven us for? It's but abundantly more than we even would like to admit. Amen. God didn't place limits on what he has forgiven us and neither should we place limits on what we should forgive of others. And in the flesh, that is a difficult thing to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The flesh likes to have hard feelings and hold grudges and certainly doesn't like to forget. But if we are to be like Christ, we are to be a forgiving people. Mm -hmm. And if we truly understand grace and what God has done for us, we should be a forgiving people. We, you know, it's not that it's okay that man should transgress against fellow man, but the fact that we have transgressed against God and yet he has chosen to forgive us and bestow grace and goodness upon us, that's Amen. Okay. <laughs> just beyond anything we deserve, and yet we oftentimes are not willing to move on from someone transgressing against us. Mm -hmm. We are also told to live peaceably with men. Mm -hmm. Romans 12, 18, if, if it be possible as much as I think you live peacefully with all men, that we are to not be hostile towards others, that we are to simply try to live a peaceful life here and be a witness to others. We can't do that when we're, we have hostility in our hearts, we? Right. we can't do that when we're holding grudges against others. I know your neighbor's hard to get along with, brother, but <laughs> you're certainly not showing him the spirit of Christ if you have a feud with him. Right. But that's what these implacable people are. They're, not only are they unforgiving, they don't want to forgive. Right. So it should never be said of the child of God, but yet it often is among the children of the wicked. He goes on from implacable to say unmerciful. And that's literally without mercy. It's not having compassion or pity on others. Luke 6, 36 commands us to be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Amen. God's mercy is higher than the heavens. It's everlasting. It endures forever. It's almost beyond our comprehension. And yet we are commanded to have the same mercy that he has. But throughout Christ's ministry, we see that he was moved with compassion. Amen. Sometimes that was for their, their physical ailments, and other times for their spiritual condition. And we often move with compassion and, and heal the sick and raise the dead. And he also, I didn't write this down, in one place he, he looked out and saw that the people were like sheep scattered without a shepherd. And he said he was moved with compassion on them. Mm -hmm. so should we not be the same way that we should? We should be a compassionate people, both towards physical problems, but also towards the spiritual. Amen. I find oftentimes professing Christians might be compassionate towards physical elements, but not so against spiritual ones. Amen. We should not look and see a, a brother or sister in 
whether if they're in sin or whether they're having difficult times and say, well, I knew that was going to happen. Or right. you see what so-and-so was doing, don't you? Mm-hmm. We're oftentimes unmerciful and we should be very merciful. You're right. We need to always remember the, what Paul said to the Corinthians, by the grace of God I am what I am. Amen. Or as in the words of another brother, when he saw the prisoner being led to the gallows to be hanged, he said, but, but by the grace of God, there go I. Mm-hmm. Again, once again, grace will cause us to see that we should be merciful, for God has been very merciful to us. Amen. That we have been forgiven much, that we have been pardoned much, that we have so we've been receivers of much more than we deserve, and yet, if we're not careful, we will be very unmerciful, very, if I could say this, judgmental. Mm-hmm. Yet, so it ought not to be among God's people. We'll go on to verse 32, and we'll get closed up here. Here, Paul says, You're knowing the judgment of God. That's where he's describing these here, this wicked here, and the, how that they knew about the judgment of God, that they they could discern between good and evil. And to some degree they had knowledge that you know good is good and evil is bad. Mm-hmm. We'll turn over to John chapter 8 and look at one instance of this, John chapter 8 verses. Seven and nine, the woman caught in adultery here. If you recall, they were, had taken up stones to stone the woman, and then Christ came along and was writing in the sand. We'll pick up in verse number seven. It says, So when they continued asking him as they were asking Christ, tempting him about this woman. And it says, He lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stopped, stooped down, and wrote on the ground. Mm-hmm. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, the woman standing in the midst. Amen. You know, as verse 9, they were convicted by their own conscience. Mm-hmm. Man, even without the Holy Spirit, has a conscience to know of good and evil. Man can understand what is okay and what is not okay. But, you know, he doesn't understand all the details of the law and all that God requires, but basically he knows between right and wrong. And yet, even these here, they were religious people. They were, would have been justified in carrying out the combination that the law required. Yet, their own conscience showed them that they were just as guilty as this woman. Right. And so it is with even the wicked of men out in the world. They, they have an understanding of what is good and what is evil. At least a very basic understanding. Mm-hmm. That is why we, we still have laws and we don't live in a completely God-forsaken society. Right. Because man does have a conscience even if it may be twisted today. We get, that is still there and still pricks men from time to time. Mm-hmm. Well, back in our text, he says that they knew the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. It says that they understood that the end result of sin is death. Well, certainly they don't understand this on a spiritual level. A man knows right. that he's going to die. Mm-hmm. Doesn't, oftentimes doesn't like the idea, not comfortable with the idea, but man is fully aware that his days are numbered. Mm-hmm. 
Romans 623 tells us the wages of sin is death. Sin always brings about death eventually. Amen. First and foremost, spiritual death, but eventually physical death is passed because of sin. Ezekiel 18 tells us the soul that sinneth it shall die. Right. So man doesn't doesn't quite understand that spiritual level of death until until God awakens him, until God quickens him, as Ephesians 2 1 tells us. But yet, man is conscious that death is coming. Amen. But he says that they see, they who know the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. He said, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Right. So even though they they have this conscience, even though they have this understanding that death is coming, it says that they not only do the same, that they do these things too. It says they have pleasure in them to do them. Right? They, right. they commit all this wickedness and are not shy about it. They, they approve of it even and those that do it. And we see that very clearly today, don't we? Mm -hmm. That wickedness is approved of more and more. That in fact, if you speak out against it, oftentimes you'll be called a bigot or right. Look at the very least old fashioned or outdated. But man is not any more wicked than he ever has been. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with Second Timothy three, when he says, "This know also in the last days, perilous times shall come," Amen. and he goes on to list. The conditions of man, they're very comparable to this list, and some of them are even repeated. It's not that man's going to become more and more depraved, more and more wicked over time. It's always been within the heart of man. Yet, at least in my view, it's, it's displayed more and more. It's approved of more and more. It's allowed by society more and more. One time you People generally did their wickedness out in the dark and they looked to be hidden. But now it's on full display, isn't it? Right. And there's a reason you had to, quote, come out of the closet because you were hiding your sin. But mm -hmm. Now you're supposed to be proud about your sin. But yet man still has this, this deep down understanding of his good versus evil. Mm -hmm. But we know that for the first Timothy 4, 2, that some have had their conscience seared with a hot iron. They might still understand as good and evil, but it doesn't bother them anymore. So it seems to be with me today. They might know what's right and what's wrong, but it doesn't bother them anymore. Right. But ultimately until God bursts you anew, until God quickens you, until God gives you a Understand of who you are, a sinner in need of a savior, a sinner deserving of hell, until you see yourself that way, sin will never truly bother you like it should. Right. Amen. So it is that man will continue on as long as time continues, <coughs> displaying and approving more and more of his wickedness. Mm -hmm. and we're going to draw chapter one to a close there. Lord will we'll pick up in chapter 2 next week, but I would like to say Paul lets up a little bit, but he doesn't. <laughs> chapter 2 is pretty scathing, and chapter 3 right. as well. Next week, Lord Bone we'll will see the man is without excuse before God. Mm -hmm. We'll close with that, folks.